Hello and welcome to the Two Robbies podcast, your destination for in-depth discussion and analysis of the Premier League. I'm Robbie Musto, he's Robbie Earl, and we're joined by a very special guest, Gary Lineker. So with that, here are today's topics. Kai Havertz haunts his former club by scoring a brace in Arsenal's 5-0 thrashing of Chelsea to keep the pressure at a high in the title race. Liverpool's title hopes are dealt a brutal blow in a 2-0 Merseyside derby defeat to bitter rivals Everton and Manchester City showcase their finest form in a 4-0 win at Brighton that keeps the fate of the title race in their own hands. And that's what we have coming up in today's episode. Well, before we get to the games, mate, we have got a special guest and just a little rundown. His career, born in Leicester, scored over 300 goals for club and country, played for Leicester, Everton, Barcelona, Tottenham, won the Copa del Rey in 1988, won the FA Cup with Spurs in 1991, played in two World Cups for England and won the 1986 World Cup Golden Boot with six goals. And I think we all know him as the host of Match of the Day. Gary, thanks so much for, for, for coming in uh, and, and speaking to us. Um, just tell us, just talk to us a little bit about the title race and how people are seeing it in the UK. Uh, well, firstly, hi both, and thanks for having me on. Um, yeah, well, it's I think it's been a really fascinating season, and I think for the first time in a long while, we've um, kind of got a three-prong title uh, mm. race, or so that might have changed a little bit over the last few days. Mm. Um, no, everyone's been really excited about it um, because, you know, Manchester City have kind of run away with things a, a couple of seasons now. Um, but, um, yeah, it's it's all... I hope I'm, We're all hoping it goes to the last day of the season because yeah. it's it's been a while since that happened. Certainly happened with three clubs. Um, with Liverpool's slight dip in form, that, that might not be the case going into the last day of the season. But there could yet be some twists and turns. Mm -hmm. But it's been thoroughly entertaining. Yeah, I, I think what we'll do now, Gary, we'll just go over this midweek round of fixtures where there has been a, mm -hmm. a, a real twist and a turn, I think. But the three uh, main teams, Rob, are playing yeah. different days. Let's go through in chronological order. Um, starting with Tuesday in Arsenal, beating Chelsea 5-0. A um, couple of goals for Kai Havertz. Ben White got a couple of goals as well. And Leandro Trussard scored the first goal after four minutes. We did see... Kai Havertz revert mm. to that False nine. nine and a half mm. or whatever he gets caught in that position there. Um, Thomas Partey was the other addition, Rob, coming in as the holding play, which allows Declan Rice to do that mm -hmm. kind of box-to-box yeah. -box stuff that he's so good at. This, this, and to Gary's point about the excitement building in, yeah. certainly building here, Gary, there's so many Arsenal fans in the US, and rightfully mm -hmm. so, mate, they are, they're really excited right now, Rob. Yeah, and, and in some respects, we, I was talking about Arsenal to Bex the other day and saying, like, they're probably the most balanced team in terms of defensive structure and shape and then attacking threats at the top end of the pitch. I'm really interested, Gary, and I'd love to get your take on Kai Havertz in a false nine role. Mm. You were a full nine in some respects, a centre forward who played down the middle, who played high. Talk to us a little bit about a, a false nine in his role and maybe changing mm. the way that the team play. Yeah, it's 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 become sort of a, a, a bit of a fashion or a fad um, playing the, the, what we call a, the false nine. Um, it's kind of a somewhere between a nine and a ten, mm. um, not quite um, a box player. But I think he plays it really well, and and obviously in the last few weeks he's he's really chipped in with a lot of goals um, because he he's not just a nine that just um, kind of drops deep and just wants to be involved mm -hmm. in the play, even though he does do that. But he's also pretty good at getting behind defenders. Yeah. Um, and that's really important, I think, for Arsenal because of the way they play. Um, it stops teams playing really high. So they have to drop off um, because of the fact that he will threaten them behind. Yeah. So they have a, a little bit of concern by that. So I think it, by that, it pushes the defenders deeper. Then you get a little bit more space in midfield. Um, but I think he, he, I think he plays it as, you know, as well as anyone has played it this season, um, certainly in the Premier League, um, particularly in the last few months. It took him a little bit of time, didn't it, to adapt to yeah. life at mm -hmm. Arsenal. But um, I like him a lot. He's a, yeah. he's a good finisher. Um, he's calm. He's got a, a lovely touch. And, and, and as I said, he can come short or he can go long. He's one of my favourites, Mr Musto, to my left is... Not so yeah, sure. I wasn't sure at the start, Gary, with mm. the signing, the big amount of money. And, and we did speak to Mikel Arteta that, that really did see him mm. when he sold him as that replacement for Granite Xhaka on the left-hand side of midfield. And you had plenty of reps there. Maybe, well, I, I, we always knew that he could play yeah. as, a, as a false star. That seems mm. to be his best position. 
Um, just on just on other things with Arsenal, Gary. Just interested, and of course, we all know what happened to Arsenal last year. What are you when you see them this season? What does it look like to you um, that they've got better, they've learned, or they've grown? Obviously, the signings will have a Declan Rice and Kai yeah. Havertz. But is there anything that you see in them differently that gives them a stronger chance of winning the title? I think they've matured a little bit more. Um, you know, it was their first real run at it, wasn't it, last mm, season? Yeah. Um, and they were they came up a little bit short at the end. But I think they really missed um, Saliba mm. um, in the last few weeks. He got injured, if you recall. Um, that's not happened um, this season. And that partnership he has with Gabriel at the back is is really strong. I mean, their defensive record is mm. is is exceptional this season um not only are they good defensively but that you know the reason they don't concede that many goals they have the ball a lot as well so they're very much a possession-based team mm. um i think they've got a bit more about them they've added to the squad as you said that we, we talked about kai habits but declan rice has been an absolutely terrific signing um he's he's played holding role for well most of the season then the last kind of last couple of months he's mm. he's been playing an, a kind of more advanced midfield role um and he's very very good at kind of breaking the lines with the ball at his feet he can run past players and um he's he looks really strong in in that position he's chipped yeah. in with more goals um because of that and i think both those additions and the fact that i think with Havertz when he came no one really knew what his position was and there's a lot of debates what is he what is he but he's as we talked um previously he's, he's 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 occupied that number nine as a kind of pole kind of false nine mm. um but but rice is all round game and his consistency um and he's pretty much been an ever present this season i think he's 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 given them that extra little bit that perhaps they didn't have last season whether it's enough to actually win the title, I don't know, because you know City are the sort of team that could just win every game now, in which case they'll win the title. Can I just follow up on that, Gary? So you just went mm. there, you know, with the big if. My question is, like, if they don't do at Arsenal this season, what do you think mm. would be the reason why? Where, where might they just come up short? I would say because Manchester City are yeah. so mm. good. Because I think if they do get beaten, it'll probably be City now after Liverpool's slip-ups. Mm. Um, I don't think it will be down. Last season, you could argue you know, mm. they fell off at the end. Mm. Um, and I, I mentioned the reasons why I thought that happened. Um, I think they've matured, they're getting better. And even if they don't quite pull it off this season, it'll be really most likely down to City's brilliance. And we know how good they are. They're probably the best team in the world. Mm. I know they got knocked out of the Champions League last week, but, mm. you know, let's be honest, they were much the better side, particularly in the second leg, and, and things didn't go for them and lost on penalties. But... No, I think um, they continue to make progress, Arsenal. They're getting closer and closer. If it doesn't happen this year, then they'll be very, very competitive uh, next year and, and, and look a solid bet to, to be consistently um, challenging for titles um, in, the, in the forthcoming years. Just before we move on, Gary, and you've touched a point now, I just wanted to get your thoughts on Mikel Arteta because sort of last season he was a bit of, you know, people poking at him in the over-celebrations and all that stuff. It looks to me like... He's matured as much as his team. I know you've had him a couple of times on Match of the Day doing a two-way with him. It feels to me like he's more comfortable in himself with, with his team. Well, he's probably matured along with the team as well. You mm. know, he's, he's, he's still relatively young um, yeah. to management. Um, I don't mind the celebrations on the touchline. I, me I, neither. I've always, <laughs> I don't mind that at all. You mm. know, enjoy it. I, mm. I don't like people that complain about that, the old um, celebration police, police. as we, yeah. we tend to call them. <laughs> Um, I like his enthusiasm. And I know he irritates um, fans, but I don't think he irritates his own fans, and that's mm. the only thing that really matters to him. Um, I think tactically he's clearly very, very good. Yeah. Um, he gets it. Um, he's obviously very cerebral. Um, he's um, learned a lot, as you would, um, alongside Pep Guardiola when he was there at Manchester City with yeah. him. Um, he just looks like he's going to be an elite manager if he's mm. not already. Yeah. Gary, just a, a quick line before we move on to, to another game on Chelsea. Um, wow, difficult difficult job for, for Pochettino, given the recruitment that's been at the football club. How do you see the situation now at Chelsea, Gary, w with it being more the, the recruitment as a problem or is Pochettino not the right guy now? Where do you think the main kind of problems lie for their struggles so far this season? Well, I don't think it's a managerial issue. Mm. I think Pochettino's, you know, yeah, a really top quality coach, and I, I think he knows what he's doing. But he's, he's, he's been dealt a, a difficult hand. Mm. Um, they, they have, you know, they've spent enormous amounts of money, but 
um, you wouldn't say particularly wisely. They've yeah. adopted this policy of spending fortunes and then having massively long contracts, enormous dressing room, lots of players, which is, you know, again, difficult to keep them all happy. Um, they're very young side. Um, I can see a, a bit of progress. Mm. You know, one or two of the signings have been good. Um, notably, of, of, of course, Cole Palmer. He wasn't playing, of course, the other yeah. night because he wasn't mm. well. Mm. I mean, he he looks an absolutely brilliant mm. talent. Um, I love watching him play. He's, he's silky, beats people easily. Um, his, his decision making is superb. Um, I like him a lot. Um, but they are very much a work in progress. And I think I think it would be a mistake if they gave up on Pochettino now and then started again um, mm. because, you know, they've got someone good in there. I, I don't think there's any doubt about that. Yes, it's been very much up and down and erratic this season, mm. but I don't think anyone would have um, done better with, with what they've got. They've got a lot of young players, big signings for a lot of money that are coming into the mm. side and trying to find their way. Um, in a side that is struggling. Now, that's difficult anyway if you've just got one new signing, let alone a handful. So I think it will take time with Chelsea, um, but they have got some very talented young players. If they had, you know, a top-quality striker, I know it sounds ridiculous when they spent about a billion pounds on their, their squad that they haven't got, you know, top-class uh, number nine, but um, if they could just do that in the summer... Um, then I think with the improvement that they'll get from their the younger players that are there, I, I can see them certainly moving in the right direction. But, you know, they're a long way off the, the top three, certainly, at the moment. Just before we move on, I've got to, I've got to get this one in, Gary. Nicholas Jackson, who, who's divisive mm. in many ways, he's 22 years of age. He's got, I believe, 10 Premier League goals this season. Can he get bettered? Can he learn some of those finishing arts that at the moment just seem to be eluding him? He makes some poor decisions. He makes bad contacts on the ball. Can you, can you as a centre forward, can you train to get better at those things? Well, you, you always can train to get better mm. and improve it. But, you know, he, he doesn't look a natural finisher. Mm. Um, but, you know, that, that, that can change with confidence as well. Um, you know, and sometimes I've seen him this season, you think, hmm, he's, he's got yeah. a bit about him and he, mm. and he does finish well. And then he'll go three or four games mm. where, he, you know, you, particularly the, um, the semi-final of the FA yeah, Cup at the weekend, yeah. where, he, you know, he had three really, really guilt-edged mm. chances and, and, and missed them. So I suspect his confidence is a little bit low. Um, he's, he's got ability. Um, but he looks like he's got a lot to do. Um, but yes, of course you can improve, Robbie. You know that yourself. Mm. You know you, you can. You can. But can you train to have a cool <laughs> yeah, head in front of goal and make the right yeah, decision? Yeah. I, I don't know. You can. You know. You can practice and practice mm. and practice, and it will make you better. But there's nothing like dealing with it in a pressurised mm. situation. It's a different thing. Let's okay. Should we move on? My Let's friend? move it on to. Mm. Um, a Merseyside derby, which, which came on the Wednesday. Uh, one of your former teams, Everton, facing Liverpool. I think we all felt that this wasn't ever going to be an easy game for Liverpool, but we were in studio both saying, because of the importance, because of the position, because of Liverpool's firepower, that, that they would go on and win the game. Not that case. Was, was this more about what Everton did or what Liverpool didn't do? A bit of both, mm. I think. I thought Everton started really well. Yeah. Um, it's, we all know it's a tough place to go, although it's not been that tough for Liverpool in recent years. In fact, they haven't won there since... Um, Everton God, haven't yeah. beaten mm. Liverpool at Goodison since, I think, 2010. Yeah. So um, they didn't go in there with uh, much of a track record. But in those games, it's, you know, it, it, there's a lot of energy. There's a, it matters a lot to, to the people of that city. Um, and I was obviously as a former Evertonian, I was I, I was chuffed that um, they finally managed to to pull off a victory. So I thought they played really well. I think tactically, you know, they do play very direct. Um, Everton under Sean Dyche, um, Liverpool, they missed a lot of chances. The, you know, they the, the blame was on themselves in many ways, and they've done that in the last few weeks. They have, and and, and it's come at a crucial time. And so, you know, they've also given a lot of goals away, Liverpool. Um, first goals of the game. Yeah. Um, by and large, though, they've come back and won them. A remarkable record of turning things around this season. But they couldn't manage it against Everton. Um, it was a huge victory for, for the home side. That I think it pretty much ensures that they'll be playing Premier League football next season, despite the point deductions that yeah. they've, they've suffered this season. But it was, it's a massive blow to Liverpool, particularly having gone out uh, in Europe the previous week and lost a game before that. So the the season looks like it's imploding mm. right towards the end, which you know we all thought maybe it was going to be 
an incredible finish to the season for Jurgen Klopp's last few weeks at, at, at the club, but it doesn't look like that's going to happen, that there really are outsiders now. Gary, of course we're going to ask you about the Liverpool forwards. Um, I just something you said there, and I want to ask you about it, and I think it probably is complicated, um, but the Jurgen Klopp announcement and the decision to do that, it... it <sighs> I don't know. I, I, I'm kind of mixed on it, and if that's hurt or, or helped or hurt their their case, and do players think, well, he's not going to be here? Do we need to impress him? Or do we are we think we might leave as well? Do you have any thoughts on that, Gary? Whether that was a wise decision to make that announcement, or do you think that it does get in subconsciously mm. into players' minds that affects their mindset in a kind of negative way? Well, firstly, I wonder whether someone had got wind of uh, mm. of what he was going to do, and it may be forced them. I don't know that. That's pure speculation on my part, um, because it is quite unusual at that stage of the season. Mm. But when he first announced it, of course, they were terrific mm, for a yeah. few weeks. Yeah. yeah, they won every yeah. single game. So I don't think players switch off. The players would be desperately yeah. hoping to win the title. And they were you know, that's a, yeah. Yeah. They, they, they were. They've just, you know, mm. they've slipped up. And all of a sudden, they've, you know, they've, they've started missing chances. Um, and that with Liverpool has not been the case prior to, to the last couple of weeks. So... I think it's it's one of those things. It's so easy, isn't it, now to say, yeah, well, if yeah, you hadn't announced yeah. it, maybe they mm. would have won the league. The truth is, we'll never know because mm. you know we've got nothing mm. to compare it with. Um, but whatever happens, whatever happens in in the running um, to the end of the season, you know, Jurgen Klopp has done an incredibly mm. wonderful job at, at Liverpool. He's, he, when he arrived there, they were kind of mid-table, a bit mediocre. They didn't have a great squad. Um, he's turned things round. They've won pretty much everything. And um, he's gone close on other times, really, really close with, with Manchester City, you know, losing the title with like 100 points. Um, so mm. it, he's done a great job. Um, lots of people will be saying that because of what's happened. Um, mm. So it, it's impossible to know, yeah. isn't it, really? Me, me and Musty here, like two old midfield players used to chug up and down a pitch <laughs> and, and kind of know what that's like and, and, and confidence. I'm just getting a feel... You know, you told us about Nicholas Jackson, like Salah and, and, and Nunez, maybe Diaz, all not sparkling at the moment. Just talk mm. to us about confidence, Gary. What what does being confident do or not being confident? Do, do you have, is, does doubt come in your mind? Do you have two or three options when you're running through? You know, Liverpool's front line have just dropped off at the wrong time for them. Yeah, I suspect there's nothing wrong in the mind of Mo Salah. He's just going through one of those little spells that yeah. all strikers or boys, you know, you call him a striker, but, you mm. know, he plays on the right, obviously, but... He's been prolific. He's been prolific again this season. Mm -hmm. He's just having a bad patch at the wrong time. Yeah. And, you know, he's come back from a couple of injuries, hamstring problems, and that can that can make a difference. Um, so, I, you know, I, I omit him from any real criticism, although, he's, you know, he's, 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 he's been a bit cold in the last few weeks, but that happens to all strikers. Yeah, confidence plays a huge part. Of course it does, Robbie. Mm -hmm. um, when you back, it's funny, though, when you're banging them in, they, you know, you can miss hit one, it'll go in the corner and stuff like that, and then yeah. suddenly things are going against you, hits the wrong side, the post goes out, keepers make great saves. Uh, Nunez is, is an interesting one mm -hmm. because I look at him and, he, he, you know, he's powerful, he's quick, he's big in the air, uh, he's, he's good in the air, and... He's, he, he looks like a lot of game. He can threaten um, defences yeah. behind. He gets behind. He's got amazing pace. But he's he's a, a little bit like Nicholas Jackson in a different kind of way. Yeah. Um, he's an erratic finisher. He tends to he tends to blast most things. And I think those strikers that I prefer plays that pass the ball into the net and mm. little dinks and you know slot it into the corners and that sort of thing. Um, so he's, it's not really happened for him. You know, there's been glimmers where you go, yeah. oh, blimey, what, what a handful he is, which he is on his day. Yeah. But I think the thing is as well with, you, you know, take Diaz as well. Um, they've all had a dip in form together, which is quite unusual because yeah. normally you might have one that stops scoring for a little while and someone else will step in. So, yeah. you know, and, and it's not like the team have not been creating chances mm. because, you know, they, they, they've yeah. been creating a lot of chances. I think... You know, I was watching Trent's performance yesterday. Well, going forward, some of his passes and chances that he created, they they really should have done better with them. No, they're not out of the of the race just yet. But is there a little bit of sense from the Liverpool fans that they're the the 
I guess if they overachieved Liverpool when when you consider the whole midfield was was changed, mm. last season was was very disappointing, and there was a sense of whether they can go again under Jurgen Klopp. Is that mm. going to be part of the sense of disappointment if they don't win the title? Is that that wow they they did great just to be in the race anyway? Mm. Well, they were going for four trophies, weren't they, until not long mm. ago. They'd already won the the Carabao Cup and um, people were talking about possible quadruple, which, oh, it's a bit of a long shot. But um, it's it, it, I think they, I think it, at the start of the season, none of us tipped them for the title because mm. of the fact that they pretty much mm. changed their entire midfield. And, and that's a hard thing to do. Um, but I think they have made good signings. Mm. Um, I think yeah. McAllister's done well. Yeah. Um, I, yeah, and I think um, that, that they've got some good players in, that they've signed. So I think you could say that they've surprised us in the, in the sense mm. that they were in the title race, right? And they still are, and still are. Yeah. So I think that's a fair point. Yeah, Robbie, yeah. Just before we move on to Liverpool, there's some breaking news today that Arna Slot has apparently said he wants to go to Liverpool. It would appear that the two clubs are talking. It, it looks like things are, are certainly starting to take shape there. Like everybody, Gary, we you know you jump on YouTube, look at on the slot, look at his team, how they play, and you know there's talk that he's very similar to Klopp. Do you think Liverpool fans would be slightly underwhelmed with an on the slot, or, or is, is his football and what he's doing and winning the the Dutch title good enough to 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 hold him in, in, in good stead? Well, it, it, it's again, it's it's difficult. It's going to be so hard to follow Jurgen mm. Klopp, whoever it is. Um, I think they've gone someone that does play a kind of dynamic, similar style, yeah. and he's he's obviously done exceptionally well in mm -hmm. in in Netherlands. Um, he's also a big personality, mm -hmm. um, which obviously Jurgen Klopp was. So it yeah. would have been difficult for someone to follow him that that wasn't. But whoever goes in, I mean, it's, I would think it's going to be really difficult. If I if I wanted the Liverpool job, I'd want it to to be the manager, the one after. Yeah. The one after. Maybe Jürgen why Xabi Alonso decided yeah. not to, to take well, it. I, I think I think probably one of the reasons. Mm. Um, although I think he wanted to do another season yeah. there because you know, he, he probably would have got the either the Bayern Munich job, mm. possibly Barcelona, and, uh, as well. Um, although Xabi has obviously announced he's now mm. going to stay, which is I think good news. Um, so. Yeah, it's, it, it would be a very, very tough act to follow for anybody. But they've gone with someone with a, a, with charisma, um, with a big personality yeah. and, and obviously a track record, albeit in a league mm. that's not obviously as strong as the Premier League. But um, it'll be the same when Pep leaves Manchester City. Yeah. If someone is, is, is that entrenched in a club and, and is, is very much the figurehead and obviously he's brilliant, um, mm. as is Pep Guardiola. Whoever follows those people, it's, it's going to be so difficult. You, you know, you're going to have to get a different staff. Everything's changed. The players have got to get used to you. You've got your own style of play. Um, it's, it, it's, it's going to be very difficult. We saw the same, with, didn't we, with Sir Alex Ferguson yeah. when he left Manchester yeah. United, when Arsene Wenger left Arsenal. They had years and, well, Manchester United <laughs> have not rallied yet. So yeah. um, it's, it, it's, going to, it's going to be a hell of a difficult <laughs> job. But, you know, for someone like that, you wouldn't turn it down, would you? Yeah, absolutely. Should we move on, my yeah, friend, let's move on to, um, to today's game? Yeah. So Brighton took on Manchester City. Mm. Gary, I'm sure you watched the game. It finished 4-0 to Man City. We're in the studio today talking about it. And, wow, it just looks so comfortable, mm. so easy. Um, they got to kind of sub players out, important players in the last 20 minutes. It felt like to me that it was kind of more like a training session, which is absolutely perfect for what City need with the games that they had. Mm. To have that kind of game where they can take a breath, they can get themselves ready for a game at the City ground against Nottingham Forest on Sunday, which I think will be very, very different. Um, mm. Is it as simple as that, Gary, on this game? I mean, we chatted about it and yeah. we kind of, I kind of said that, God, that was so comfortable for City and you said, well, they still have to they, they do certain things. They make it comfortable. The way, yeah. How did you see the, yeah. the game today, Gary? I thought Manchester City were, was, was superb and mm. I thought they, you know, the, the thing is as well, it makes it so much easier when you score three goals in the first <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. half an hour or so. Mm. Um, and you know, they've got brilliant players, uh, so yeah. much, so much talent there, you know, De Bruyne and Foden and Bernardo Silva and you, you could go through so many. Um, I don't think Brighton helped themselves, particularly mm. made one or two, obviously, mm. you know, catastrophic errors defensively. But um, you know they're a good side. We've seen them in run-ins. They tend to win. They tend to win every game, which is um, they obviously they've got five games left. Um, if there is a plus to losing to Real Madrid in the in the Champions yeah. League, it's 
it's two less fixtures. I'm saying two because obviously mm. the Champions League final is after the Premier League season finishes anyway. Um, so the fact that they've got more games to play than the others at the top would have perhaps been tricky if they played two semi-finals mm. of the Champions League as well. Um, they're going to take some stopping. Um, they've got a little bit of a kind of dodgy track record at Tottenham mm. yeah. um, in recent years. Mm. So that that could be a potential banana skin. But obviously Arsenal have got to go there uh, as well. And that's always a big one, North London derby. But I mean, they play such good football. And it's not just the football they play. It's how they win the ball back so quickly yeah. and aggressively. Yeah. And they, mm. they've got, you know, incredible players, but they also work their socks off. Yeah. You know, and they mm. that immediacy that they get the ball back as soon as the other team has it, you, you know, they get it back within 10 seconds most of the time. And it's so hard to play against because mm. you never have the ball. <laughs> 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 and, and, and in football, that's that's pretty difficult. Yeah, yeah. difficult. yeah for sure. And um, there was a day today where I think City's gain is also England's gain. I'm talking about Phil Foden, mm. 16 Premier League goals. We, we had a little chat with him after the game. And he talked about actually by coming more central in the game, he's getting more shots, he's more involved with the action, and that's why his numbers are going up. Is it almost a search? Have we got almost players who are becoming search for, for Gareth's team in, in the yeah. Euros that, that come? Foden being one, Bellingham be, being another one with Harry Kane at the top of the pitch. Yeah, we've got about 15 certs, <laughs> which is a, yeah, which is a great point. great position to be in. If you, you look at the number 10 roles alone. You could yeah. play, you know, you've got Foden. Bellingham's been playing there yeah. most of the season mm. or even mm. as a false nine uh, for Real Madrid. Um, Cole Palmer's unbelievable. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, someone like James Madison might mm. not even make the squad and he's uh, absolutely um, fantastic footballer. Yeah. So... But yeah, I think, I mean, Foden, yes. And um, he is better, I think, centrally in, a, mm. in, in kind of that 10 role because he takes the ball on the half turn so well and he's so sharp and quick and beats people, glides past mm. them, scores goals, creates goals. Um, I think we've all known for, for a while that he was, he's, you know, from when he was 16, 17, yeah. that he was, he was given a fair run that, um, you know, he was going to be a top, top player. And, and, and he's, he's obviously massively beneficial to have, have learned under Pep Guardiola and Pep's been patient with him sometimes people say he should be playing more should be playing more yeah. but he's gradually eased him in and he's, he's I think he's he's played more minutes this season than anyone um and you know I shouldn't say this touch wood that he you know he, he tends not to get injured mm -hmm. um which is an yeah. important thing as well but I'll be I'll, it, it will certainly start for England. Whether he starts in the 10, yeah. uh, I, I mm. don't know. Um, but the way that England played against Belgium in the last game was the first time I've seen um, Gareth's team. They were rotating. They all played yeah. in different positions. They were swapping and changing. And I think that England have got the players, certainly in the forward six positions, yeah. that can very much do that. And they have depth as well. Mm. So, yeah, I think you know, it's hard to see that Foden wouldn't start. Gary, you know, just, just uh, as we kind of think about Man City on the brink of something very, very special, very historic um, to win, if they do, of course, four Premier League titles on the spin or top flight titles on the spin, never been done before in English football. And, of course, we know what, what a manager he is and what a squad they have. <sighs> the charges and, you know, <laughs> yeah, the, I, I mean, I, I feel like there's so much kind of credit and and, and like gratitude and appreciation that, um, that we're all willing to throw onto this football club and this manager. How much is it for you, Gary, a cloud that these charges haven't been sorted out right now? Does it in any way change your, I don't know, excitement of the special things that they're doing right now? Well, it is a cloud. We all know that. Um, it's, it's very hard to, to unearth um, what exactly most of the charges are. Um, I think nearly all of them were pre-PEP, which I think is important to stay. I don't think it, whatever happens, I don't think it takes anything away from Pep Guardiola's right. brilliance. Mm. I don't I don't think it does. Um, but in terms of Manchester City, we're going to have to wait and see. I mean, how long we're going to have to wait, I don't know. Obviously, you know, they'll have, you know, <laughs> the most expensive lawyers <laughs> uh, available. 
Um, but if 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 they've acted in an unfair or or wrong manner, then you know they'll have to be punished. We don't know what those punishments would be. We don't yeah. know whether they'll be found guilty of one charge or 119, whatever it is. Mm. So of course it it's a cloud that's hanging over the club. But I don't, you know, I can't see it um, being resolved imminently. So it mm. certainly won't be this season. So. Mm-hmm. Um, I, yeah, I think all Manchester City fans will will be slightly worried. You know what it's like um, as as a fan of a football club. They'll they'll always defend their team and yeah. say, "Oh, we didn't do anything," and all that kind of stuff. It's um, and you know you, you can give them all the praise in the world, but as soon as you mention that, they you know they they get they get very upset. Um, but I it's it, it's it's a big cloud, and it's a cloud that that won't go away, and and, and I don't think it will go away. In the near future, I think it would be another year, few years yet. Probably, I don't know. I don't know. I, it, we're in the dark, really. Just a just a follow up and something a little yeah. bit brighter uh, uh, conversation. Brighton and Roberto De Zerbi. Mm. Now, I, I I've loved watching him coach Gary and, and what he does. <laughs> and of course, we set the teams up every weekend with our lineups, mm. and we kind of try and read what he's going to do. And he's one of their managers that that is difficult to kind of know what he does. Now, there's a lot of talk about him going to separate football clubs. Um, and I think there's no question what an amazing job he's done at Brighton, given the, the style of play, given the injuries and stuff they've had this year and, and what he's done over last season and this season, getting to the last 16 of the Europa League. First off, are you a fan of, of how, he, how he manages and how he coaches? Mm. And maybe more importantly, where's his next step? And, I, I, you know, if mm. there is a next step from Brighton, is he ready for one of these big jobs that, that are coming up both in the Premier League and probably overseas as well? I like him as a coach. I like the way his teams play. Um, I, I, I judge football and teams and managers by the style of their mm. football, that, that it's entertaining, that, that it's enjoyable to watch. That's very important for me. And you want to watch Brighton play because yeah. you know they yes they take risks as we saw um, in this evening's game. Um, you know gave uh, one dreadful mistake away, but you know you, when you take risks, there's a reason for that you, because you know if you can break the press, then yeah. you're through. And we've yeah. seen how brilliant they are on the counter attack this season. So, yeah. um, but I think it's been tough this season. And probably you mentioned the Europa League and the fact they got to the last 16. That makes life tougher because obviously you know they don't have the squad depth of, of of the big teams at the at the very top of the league. But it's it's been a very well run club. I sensed he was a little bit frustrated by things in the last yeah. few months, possibly with um, what's going on and, um, and and what he could spend and bring in. Um, so I I be surprised if he was still at Brighton next season whether he's ready for you know one of the big clubs you don't really know with managers until mm, no, till they yeah. get that opportunity mm. um I like the way he plays I think it, you know I, he's got incredible enthusiasm for the game I like his uh, his dynamic nature so I think he would do well um but it's a bit I've seen so, manage- mm. so many bit- managers I've yeah. seen that that, yeah. that then it happens and it doesn't quite um doesn't quite happen for them so we'll see as we've got you, Gary, we, we've got to ask the big question. Yep. Uh, Liverpool, 74 points. Manchester City, 76 points. Arsenal, 77. Mm. Who finishes top May the 19th? Well, I tipped Arsenal at the start of the season. I've stuck with them throughout. So I'm going to stick with them now, okay. although it's with... Ve- although, <laughs> although, if I had to put my life on it, it'd be Manchester City. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> yeah. All right, that two-way answer. And let's talk about your podcast, Gary. Um, the rest is football with Alan Shearer and Micah Richards. I know you have fun with these guys and something a little bit different. Um, talk to us a little bit about it. Yeah, we, we started it at the, the beginning of this season. That, um, and I've, I've, I've got a podcast company called uh, Goal Hanger. And we've, thankfully, we've, it's, it's amazing. We've got you know, a lot of the biggest pods in the UK and, and Europe and one or two in the world. So... Um, we wanted to do a football one, and I, I wanted to do it with Alan and and Micah. Um, we do pretty much what you do, um, mm-hmm. and you know, talk mostly about Premier League, but also obviously Champions League. But you know, we we also talk about our life's experiences, our football experiences. Um, we have a lot of fun. Um, Alan's um, obviously been one of the great strikers in English football, in world football, really. Mm-hmm. Um, Mike is an incredible personality. Mm-hmm. Um, he. Um, he's, he's, he's got an infectious enthusiasm, um, a real laugh, and we have a lot of fun with it. And um, it's 
very quickly become kind of the biggest sporting pod in in the UK, and people seem to enjoy it, which is which is great. So, you know, if you know if you're looking for a football pod apart from the two Robbies, as <laughs> well as the two Robbies, I oh, should yeah, say, yeah. the rest is football over there in America. It's <laughs> it is available. You, you you couldn't get two more contrasting characters, really, could you? Alan mm. Shearer and Michael Richards. I mean, they're two different ends <laughs> of the scale in many yeah. respects, but it, it yeah. just seems to work. Real chemistry. It, it, it does work. And I think um, I think Alan surprised a few people because obviously mm. on Match of the Day, which is a show we do in England, which has been going since 1964, um, 60 years now, um, and he's obviously the main pundit on, on, on yeah. that show. And um, the, the nature of the show, it's very, very structured. We show the highlights of a game, then we talk about it, then we show the next one. And it's... Um, but I think... Alan's real personality, because people thought he was quite serious and stuff, but he's, you know, he's actually a fun guy, and he's, um, he swears a lot on the podcast. Uh, <laughs> we don't swear, do we? Which we people swear, like, no, we're not swear, we're not allowed to swear Real. Yeah. Swear Real. <laughs> just tell me, Gary, as well, just uh, saw something at the weekend. You you were doing the semi-finals uh, from Wembley pitch side. Pep came up mm. after they got the one 0 <laughs> win. I believe the word is you left him hanging. I Gary. did. I did. Explain. Um, well, he jumped in and he wanted to make a point. Um, he had a bit of a rant about the, the fact that they pl had to play three days um, after losing against Real Madrid in extra time. Um, and I think he felt it was a good opportunity to do so, having just won the game, um, mm. kind of snuck through. But And I think he had a point in some ways. Um, but, you know, and then we, we were chatting and we were chatting and I'm, I'm getting the count because I'm the presenter of um, for, for BBC's football. And... Um, I was asking him questions and then he was talking and then I hear the count, I've got 10 seconds, nine seconds, eight seconds, I've got mm. to get us off air. So yeah. I switched to camera and as I turned to camera to, to get us off air, Pep put his hand out to say thank you and I didn't see it. So <laughs> about seven or eight seconds and his hand waiting. And then just as I delivered that. I, that I, didn't I go viral it. then, obviously. Uh, uh, well, it certainly did. I saw, I, you know, I saw it kind of clipped up afterwards, but it was quite amusing. Yeah. Gary, just, what's it like going from a from a player to a pundit to a host? Mm. I mean, somehow I have actually hosted our show here. He's laughing. <laughs> yeah. I've hosted our show a couple of times. Hosted in inverted in commas. Inverted commas. Mm. How have you enjoyed it? How is it different? And, and um, mm. I guess what do you prefer? Well, there's nothing beats playing, nothing beats scoring a goal. Um, but I, I prefer um, hosting to to being the pundit. Although I, I, you know, I can still get my opinions in if I want yeah. to when mm. I chat. Um, but it, it's a bit more challenging. And I looked at it when I first, um, fit, when I finished my career and I went into television. Um, I looked at other sports, and w w we have a sport here called cricket, and that was done by David Gower, who's one of our great cricketers. We did tennis with Sue Barker, and I thought I looked at football, and I thought, this, why, why is there not a you know big football person presenting all the football here? Mm. So I thought to myself, if I can crack that side of things, and it is more challenging, it is more difficult. I thought it might give me some longevity. So, 30 years on, I, I think I might have been proven right for once in my life. That's brilliant, great. mate. Great stuff. Uh, thanks so much for coming on, Gary. It's been an absolute pleasure as ever. Mm -hmm. And the yeah. rest of his football podcast, go to wherever you get your podcasts mm -hmm. and listen in to um, some good football information, some great fun as well with Gary, Micah and Alan Shearer. Thanks, Gary. But, uh, uh, that's absolute, it. Abs absolute delight. Enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Cheers, mate. Thanks, Thank you, because we know it's late. And in time <laughs> to bed and a, and a cup of co co it is. cocoa. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Take care. That's it for this midweek podcast. We're delighted to have England great Gary Lineker join us in the debate. We'll be back at the weekend to review Match Week 35 and the big North London derby. But for now, I'm Earl. He's Musty together with the two Robbies. Thanks for watching and listening. Be safe, stay healthy. It's a good night from me. And it's a good night from him. Good, good night. night. Hi there, I'm Rebecca Lowe, studio host for NBC's coverage of the Premier League. Don't forget to hit subscribe to watch more videos all season long. And for even more Premier League content, from original series to live matches, head over to Peacock. And be sure to tune in for Premier League mornings every weekend on USA Network and on Peacock. We will see you there.